Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, Curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today we've got another video in our Ship Comparison Series. And today we're going to look at the uh, German pocket battleships, uh, specifically Admiral Graf Spee, because she was the largest of them, that was completed at least. So, first disclaimer, pocket battleships are not actually battleships. Pocket battleships was a colloquial term invented by the British press uh, to describe these vessels, uh, and we'll talk about why that is later on in the video. The Germans called them Panzerschiff, or armored ships, uh, which also sort of throws off because armor is not their greatest asset. Uh, however, early in World War II, they were all redesignated as heavy cruisers, which is pretty accurate. The, the most accurate thing would be to call them uh, armored cruisers because they are essentially an extension of the pre-World War I era armored cruiser designs. That's the most similar thing to them, although in actuality there's, there's nothing else like them out there, and I, I think that's why these ships are interesting. Uh, they are some of my favorite uh, German warships of World War II. So there were three of them that were actually built. Deutschland, which was renamed Lutzau in uh, early in World War II, right after her first deployment, because Hitler was afraid of losing a ship named Germany. Um, Admiral Scheer and Admiral Graf Spee. Each of these three ships was built by the Reichsmarine prior to Hitler taking power, and they fall under the Treaty of Versailles limitations of the German Navy. And um, each one is a little bit bigger and better than the last one, although collectively they are known as a single class of warships. Uh, and this is not uncommon in smaller navies like Germany's was restricted to at this time. To uh, Rather than building a bunch all at once, you're gradually building increasingly better and better uh, ships under the same hull. Now the U.S. Navy does something similar with our Arleigh Burke destroyers that come in a couple of different flights. Flight 1, Flight 2, Flight 2A, and now Flight 3. Uh, but the U.S. Navy, there are multiple ships built to each of those standards. Um, with this, they just have three of them, so they keep going. A further two Panzer ship uh, named D and E, which would become the battleships Scharnhorst and Eisenau, were laid down, but converted into full-on battleships during construction. Uh, Germany would have gotten six if they followed naval treaties, um, but under Plan Z, had three already converted two into battleships and uh, had another 12, known as the P-class, uh, planned out, but uh, as far as I know, none were ever laid down. So, um, the Panzer Schiff are very much the product of Admiral Wolfgang Zenker, who predated Admiral Eric Rader, who would command the Kriegsmarine during World War II. Uh, and Zenker realized that his navy could either be a coastal defense force or a commerce raiding force, and he is the individual who chose commerce raiding. And that's specifically what the pocket battleships are good at. So, let's go back to the Treaty of Versailles real quick. Um, Germany was forced to turn over most of the high seas fleet's capital ships. All of the battle cruisers and most of the dreadnought battleships were interred at Scapa Flow, where they scuttled themselves during the uh, treaty writing process. Uh, this infuriated the Allies, which were going to divvy these up as war prizes, uh, and so, even though they had initially let Germany retain their oldest classes of dreadnought battleships uh, as a coast defense force, they now claim those as reparations. Ships like the German battleship Ostfriesland were seized at this time and given to the United States as reparations, which was then expended in aerial bombing tests. Uh, so, this relegated the German Navy of the interwar period under the Treaty of Versailles to just six pre-dreadnought battleships for coast defense, six light cruisers, and uh, 12 each destroyers and torpedo boats. After 20 years, 
they were allowed to replace these ships. And because the Treaty of Versailles predates the Washington Naval Treaty, the new ships were supposed to be 10,000 tons light load displacement, as opposed to Washington Naval Treaty cruisers, which would be 10,000 tons standard displacement, standard displacement being an artificial construct defined during the Washington Naval Treaty. Uh, and so the pocket battleships would all be slightly larger than the treaty cruisers that other countries were building, and this was completely legal, although Graf Spee definitely uh, weighed in over that, but uh, in theory, these ships by design were not breaking any uh, of the international laws, even though they're heavier than what their counterparts are using. Uh, the cruisers are limited to 6,000 tons, the destroyers are just 600 tons, so the, the Kriegsmarine ships are made are, are allowed to be roughly as powerful as the Scandinavian warships uh, in service at that time. So they would make a good regional coast defense force, but they cannot project power the way the high seas fleet had, and they can't challenge uh, the Royal Navy or even be on par with the French and Italian navies. So uh, when these pre-dreadnoughts start to reach 20 years old, the Navy solicits a series of design proposals for new ships. And some of these design proposals are for pure coastal defense ships with four 15-inch guns, and uh, some of them are for traditional heavy cruisers with eight-inch guns, uh, and some of them are somewhere in between, like uh, the pocket battleships that were actually chosen. So Zenker realizes that uh, the German military is not a defense force. So maintaining a defense force for the Navy while having an offensive uh, land force or uh, air force means that the Navy cannot support your other branches and won't get funding. So he decides that in a future war, Germany will need commerce raiders, whether they are attacked by France or some other European power, or whether they are the aggressors, commerce raiders will do way more damage than maintaining a coast defense force. Uh, and so, the designs for monitor-style ships are thrown out the window, and it basically becomes, do we want a 32-knot, 8-inch armed heavy cruiser, uh, or do we want something a little bit different? And, and Zenker comes up with a really, really innovative ship. The pocket battleships are some of the first ships to use welding in their construction, and they save 15% of the weight of the hull by going from riveting to welding, just the weight of rivets holding steel plates together. So this means that there's a lot more ship than anybody else has at this point for this much weight. Secondly, he chooses diesel engines as the main propulsion. It's never been done on a major warship like this. Uh, and the diesel engines are going to give these ships tremendous range. However, it's going to limit their speed. We'll come to that a little bit later on. But a series of decisions are made to make these really excellent commerce raiders. Uh, and finally, uh, the main battery is battleship caliber, 11-inch guns. They were originally looking at 12-inch guns. I thought they might instigate the Western powers too much, so they, they decided to scale up all the way back to 11 inches. Um, so this very effectively outguns any other cruiser out there. Uh, their armor is probably the weakest part of this design, but it's uh, on par or better than any of the other treaty cruisers out there. And then their speed, it's a little bit slower than most cruisers, but there are some interesting trade-offs there, and it's faster than almost any battleship out there. Uh, and this sparks pocket battleship fear, because when these are built, only uh, the British fast battleship Hood can catch them. Uh, the battle cruisers Renown and Repulse are similar in speed uh, and could theoretically run them down, but other ships could not catch them. So they have the gunnery to outgun any cruiser, and they can outrun almost any ship in the world. So as a commerce raider in the broad expanses of the Atlantic, they're virtually uncatchable. This causes the French to build an entire class of warship 
uh, Dunkirk and Strasbourg uh, specifically to hunt these ships down. And they use their battleship tonnage to do it, and they build a ship uh, that is inferior to any other battleship under construction, specifically to hunt down these panzer ships which causes the Germans to respond with Scharnhorst and Eisenau, which causes the French to respond with Reichelieu, which causes the Germans to respond with the Bismarck. So you get a mini arms race there, but it's absolutely absurd to me that a country would use uh, their limited resources as a way of countering just three ships. It shows you how much fear there was in these ships and just how capable they were in theory. In practice, they, they're less than fully capable. The war begins with Scheer in port undergoing maintenance, but prior to Germany invading Poland, Hitler orders Deutschland into the North Atlantic and Grafschwe into the South Atlantic, and critically, he sends each one with a resupply ship. Deutschland's performance is unimpressive at best. She sinks three ships and slinks back to Germany. Graf Spey, on the other hand, uh, manages to run wild for about two months, two and a half months, uh, and she captures nine ships, and right when she's getting to the part where, where she needs some maintenance, her captain decides that uh, he's willing to throw his ship against uh, warships to score a good defeat on the enemy, maybe catch the uh, convoy that they're hunting uh, before he retreats to Germany. And uh, it's an interesting idea. It's not exactly what happens because Captain Langsdorff's counterpart here is the British Commodore Harry Harwood. And Harwood does two very interesting things that uh, I'm not sure Langsdorff predicted. One, Harwood decided that uh, he's got four cruisers for the entire uh, South American coast. He decides that he has to keep his ships combined to be able to do anything against the Germans. So he first thinks that it, maybe they're gonna raid the Falkland Islands. Uh, that was something that World War I era Admiral Graf Spee, the individual, did with his fleet, uh, and the anniversary was coming up. So he takes his force down there and then when that doesn't happen, he thinks the River Plate estuary is a huge hub for merchant ships. I bet that's where Langsdorff is going to go next. Uh, so he takes only three of his four ships are operational at the time. He takes all three of them there uh, and intercepts Langsdorff perfectly. He predicts uh, where Langsdorff last was, how fast he was going, and what his exact destination was, and he gets it entirely right and intercepts the German raider on that day. Uh, so that, that is pure brilliance. It should not have happened, uh, but Harwood did a really good job of, of what he was doing, was able to track down Graf Spee. Uh, the other thing he did was realize that his ships are all inferior individually to Graf Spee. He doesn't need to sink Graf Spee, he just needs to damage her a little bit. That might prevent her from getting home. It might slow her down. Uh, and he was willing to sacrifice all of his ships in order to score a little bit of damage so that Graf Spee could be hunted down and cornered later on. And this works as well. Langsdorff spots uh, the mast of the largest British ship, the heavy cruiser Exeter, thinks that she's alone, and decides to engage. There are, in fact, three British cruisers, and they are not escorting a convoy, so Langsdorff has no reason to maintain the engagement at this point. However, the cruisers are faster than him, so he has to disable them to be able to get away. Langsdorff uses his 11-inch guns and concentrates them on Exeter, the biggest ship, while he uses his smaller 5.9-inch guns to keep the 6-inch armed Ajax and Achilles at bay. He's able to shoot Exeter up, and it's a wonder she wasn't sunk uh, before the two six-inch armed cruisers get close enough that they're able to do some damage, uh, and he decides to split his main battery and start aiming at them. And he's able to damage both of those ships uh, pretty well as well, and then he uh, 
uses a torpedo attack. Langsdorff is a, a torpedo expert to try and uh, get away. He's able to escape to the neutral port of Montevideo in Uruguay. International law gives him three days to refuel and make repairs before he has to put to sea. And the British have him cornered at this point. Um, he has taken a few light repairs, nothing to his combat ability, but his galley's been damaged, so that's going to make it difficult for him to get back to Germany, and he's real worried about his chances from here. And the British do some really brilliant espionage work. Uh, one, their diplomatic offices work really closely uh, with the Navy to allow Uruguay to let uh, Graf Space stay there longer so they can rush their ships to the area. And two, they spent, spread a lot of false rumors that they've got battle cruisers and aircraft carriers like Ark Royal on the scene so that when uh, Langsdorf comes out, he's going to be overwhelmed. This isn't true. The uh, heavy cruiser Cumberland, Harwood's fourth ship, does show up, although her engines aren't uh, fully repaired. And uh, that's basically just replacing Exeter, which has been disabled and has to leave for repairs. Um, and the other British ships are certainly on the way, but they're not going to get there within three days. Langsdorf, uh, believing he's outnumbered and not wanting to lose his crew in the uh, desperate final action that Hitler demands, sails his ship out uh, a little bit further out to sea and then scuttles her in shallow water, uh, gets his whole crew ashore where they're interned, and then commits suicide. For the rest of the war, uh, these commerce raiders are kind of hampered. Germany doesn't really let them break out into the North Atlantic again. They're sent up to uh, Norway, and then commerce raiding up there isn't so great. Uh, the British are really worried about them, so they're constantly bombing them. Eventually, they're pulled back to the Baltic as Germany loses a lot of their outside territories, and they use their guns to uh, render support to the German army as it's being beaten back by the Russians. Um, one of the ships uh, scuttles, the other one is sunk by British bombers, and uh, basically the end of the story there. This, these ships could have probably been used better, and they were very uh, well designed as commerce raiders, but they never really got the chance to do it. Uh, and by the uh, time they were used, there were enough aircraft that surface raiders mid-war uh, were rendered uh, almost unusable. In the 20s and 30s, when these ships were designed and built, aircraft didn't have the range to be able to find them in the open ocean, but by the time they're actually deployed, uh, aircraft rendered them relatively obsolete, and submarines being able to hide from aircraft underwater are much more effective. So the resources used here arguably could have been much better spent on or eight U-boats for each of the pocket battleships and their crew. So, how do these vessels compare to New Jersey? I'm going to specifically use uh, Admiral Graf Spee because she is the largest of them, and I'm specifically using New Jersey because I have New Jersey. I have an Iowa-class battleship. I, I could compare them to Dunkirk or to a contemporary heavy cruiser or Exeter or something like that, but I happen to have one Iowa-class battleship here, so that's what I'm using. So, uh, first off, displacement. New Jersey's around 57,000 tons. These ships have cruiser displacement. The, the heaviest of them at full load is only 16,000 tons. So that's pretty good for a World War II cruiser, but completely outclassed by a battleship. Size-wise, she's 610 feet long which is right around the length of uh, existing pre-war battleships. So I, I believe off the top of my head, Arizona is about 624 feet long. Uh, so it's right in league with where cruisers and older battleships are, but New Jersey being the longest battleship ever built at 887 feet uh, is more than 250 feet longer. She's only 71 feet wide, so there's a great length to beam ratio here. Um, but that means that she's relatively narrow, even by some cruiser standards, and doesn't have much depth for torpedo defense. And she draws 24 feet of water, which uh, is about 14 feet less than New Jersey. 
having a ship with that draft combined with 11-inch guns means that uh, it's pretty good for shore bombardment. And Deutsch, uh, Graf Spee's sister ships do uh, do some devastating shore bombardment late in the war. Uh, they even fire their guns until the rifling is worn out and continue to just randomly lob shells into the enemy's direction. Engineering. These ships had eight diesel uh, motors. They produced 54,000 shaft horsepower. That is less than a quarter of the 212,000 horsepower that an Iowa-class battleship makes. One Iowa-class engine is more powerful than all eight diesels on uh, Graf Spee. Graf Spee only has two propellers, and her top speed is 28.5 knots. Uh, so that's underwhelming. In, in an age when most cruisers are 30 to 33 knots, um, 28 knots is, is kind of on the low end. Even battleships during this time period are being built at 28 to 30 knots, although existing pre-war battleships all tend to be 21 to 24 knots. Uh, so, you know, they, they can't outrun cruisers, even though individually they can fight a cruiser, but they cannot outfight two cruisers. Uh, they can't outrun modern battleships. Countries that are allowed to or forced to build their ships first often end up inferior to what other people are doing. So the German ships, because they were given older ships, came up for replacement earlier in the 1920s, and so they built theirs first. So they're only looking at what people already had. Uh, so now everybody else is building their ships with these in mind. So cruisers and uh, battleships built after this are very easy counters to this type of ship. The one thing that these ships do that blows everybody else, including New Jersey, out of the water is at a speed of 18.69 knots, they have a range of 16,300 nautical miles. An Iowa-class battleship only has a range of about 15,000 nautical miles at a much lower 15 knot speed. So not only is Graf Space cruising speed faster, uh, but her range is significantly longer. And that's amazing. That, that's purely because she's running on diesel power. The Iowas carry far, far more fuel. Uh, so easily the best feature of these ships is their ability to stay out at sea unsupplied for incredibly long periods of time. For a crew, these ships aren't too huge of an investment. Uh, they have about 30 to 40 officers if they're not being used as a flagship, uh, and somewhere between 600 and 1,000 enlisted guys, depending on if you're looking at the pre-war or wartime numbers. That is enough crew for 10 U-boats, but uh, even in terms of cruisers, that, that's not a huge crew, partially because um, they've got a couple of very big guns. They don't have a huge number of smaller guns like some cruisers. So armament, six 11-inch guns, eight 5.9-inch guns, interestingly, in single mounts, four on each side. Six 4.1-inch guns as the uh, heavy anti-aircraft battery. This is pretty light. They've got one each side of midships and one back aft, super firing over the after triple 11-inch turret. Uh, so they can fire four of these guns to either side, uh, which is kind of anemic even for cruisers of that time. Germany's inability to make a dual-purpose secondary battery uh, is really a huge problem. And the fact that they use 11-inch guns mean that they can't just rely on a 4-inch secondary. Those 11-inch guns uh, are slow firing, so they do need a heavy secondary battery to be able to fill the gap uh, when their guns are firing. They, this does come in handy. Graf Spee is able to engage multiple ships at once because of this, uh, but if she runs into aircraft, forget about it. She's got nothing. As a Kromers Raider, she's armed with eight 21-inch torpedo tubes. American cruisers at this time uh, either are built without or lose their torpedo tubes, 
so it's interesting that uh, Grafs Bay does. They're built on the fantail, so they have really incredible arcs of fire. They can't, they don't just fire a broadside. And they're in moderately armored box launchers. However, uh, the fantail, because it's both not armored and welded uh, and steps down lower than the rest of the hull, is very wet and uh, pretty vulnerable. German ships in general have their fantails blown off a lot during this time period. Uh, so that doesn't threaten the rest of the ship, but it does leave you dead in the water. Again, uh, this is okay for anti-surface warfare. Langsdorff does fire it on the British cruisers as a way of breaking off the engagement, even though he's fighting faster ships. Um, but it's primarily for commerce raiding, so you can torpedo and sink an enemy uh, marching ship. The ship have four twin 37mm anti-aircraft guns. This is a garbage weapon system. Uh, the inch and a half gun is pretty widely adopted around the world at this time, and it's in some places a pretty good anti-aircraft weapon. Uh, the U.S. goes up a little bit heavier with the 40mm gun, which is an excellent mid-range anti-aircraft weapon, but the German 37mm is manually loaded one round at a time, so its rate of fire is abysmally low compared to the 40 millimeter gun where you're just dropping clips of ammunition into the top and it can continuously fire at your tracking aircraft. And finally, uh, Grouch Bay had uh, up to about 14 20 millimeter guns. She might have carried more at different times, but that's how many she had during the Battle of the River Plate. Uh, some of her guns were taken off to arm merchant ships. And uh, her sister ships that survived a little bit longer had some additional anti-aircraft guns added but they were still nothing compared to other countries' uh, ships, even when you purely look at European cruisers of this time period. The AA armament is anemic. Armor is okay. It's not going to stop everything. It's certainly not going to stop battleship caliber shots, but it's okay for other cruisers. Uh, interestingly, this ship, like a battle cruiser, is armored against cruiser guns and not against uh, her own size guns. The turret faceplate is the thickest at 5.5 inches. The belt on Graf Spee is about 3.9 inches thick, uh, which is thicker than any of her sister ships. And the deck is about 2.8 inches thick. Uh, so again, okay against cruisers, not the best out there. Compared to an Iowa, this isn't a fair comparison. It's comparing any cruiser to a battleship. Uh, Except she's also slower. Um, her guns cannot shoot through New Jersey's armor, although the rate of fire on them is pretty impressive. It's around uh, three rounds a minute, whereas ours is two at best. Um, so she can really smother you with firepower, and they're relatively long range. Uh, the 11 inch guns have a range not too far off from other ships' uh, heavier caliber battleship guns. Uh, another interesting thing about the diesel generators that are powering this ship is you can very easily throw them online and increase your speed. So even though Graf Spee has less speed than the British cruisers, she was able to dictate the early engagement because both her and the British cruisers are sailing at economical speeds. She sees the British cruisers, throws on the extra diesel generators, and immediately picks up speed, and is very, very maneuverable because you can very easily reverse uh, power. So you can spin one shaft one way or the other another to turn tighter. Whereas steam-powered ships like Harwood's Cruisers or Battleship New Jersey takes up to 20 minutes to build up steam pressure when you're bringing more boilers online and trying to uh, increase your speed. And uh, it takes a very long time to bleed off that pressure to spin your turbines in the other direction. So the it doesn't help with maneuverability. So early in a battle, Graf Bay has the faster speed and the better maneuverability. So she can very much choose to engage and how. Uh, but as you get later into a battle, as your enemy ships pick up speed, they then exceed your own speed. Uh, so Graf Bay is an extremely innovative ship. Uh, in the 1920s and 30s, when this class of ship was designed and built, uh, it was a good idea, and the fact 
that the Germans specifically designed them for one thing. These are going to be good at commerce rating. And they did a ton of innovation to make them specifically good at that one thing. And they don't do like other uh, ships that they build specifically under the Kriegsmarine. Fascist states, you tend to build uh, much larger phallic symbols of your dictatorship uh, and you try to throw the kitchen sink on. It's got to be good at this and good at that and good at this. This being a Reichsmarine uh, German uh, design that predates Hitler means that uh, they are just trying to do the one thing good, commerce rating. We're putting on an innovative gun system for that. We're putting on an innovative uh, propulsion system for that. We're armoring it specifically for that. She can't fight battleships. She can outrun them all that are in existence now. Uh, so I, I think very highly of these ships. They've really captured my imagination. But trying to compare them to an Iowa-class battleship is apples and oranges. Um, they do not compare well. Even if you think of them as commerce raiders. Uh, one of the earliest ideas for Iowa-class battleships with their high speed was they can be loosed in the Western Pacific as commerce raiders, or they can be retained in the Eastern uh, Pacific to hunt down enemy commerce raiders. The Iowas have tremendous range and speed and anti-aircraft protection and armor and guns. Um, so I dare say an Iowa-class battleship getting loose on the uh, Japanese convoy routes between their oil-rich Dutch East Indies that we know about and Japan uh, could do easily as much or more damage uh, without being hard countered by anything as the pocket battleships proved able to do. However, it's a significantly larger investment of your nation's resources, both in initial building and then manning and operating them over time. Uh, so for the small local force that the uh, Reichsmarine was, the pocket battleships made more sense. They weren't even allowed to build battleships, so it made great sense. I think of the three options, a coastal defense ship, a true heavy cruiser, and a pocket battleship, uh, they made the right decision for that period of time. What are your thoughts on the German pocket battleships? Let us know in the comment section down below. I think it would be hard to argue that they compare to an Iowa-class battleship, but how do you think they compare to some of the other warships out there? I'd love to hear your opinions. Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, and also from a number of other uh, private businesses and individuals like yourselves. If you would like to continue supporting our museum and the YouTube channel, there's a link in the description below. Uh, we really appreciate the support, and you can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing to these videos so that more people see them and find out about our museum. Thanks for watching.